Well, all right, here we are at 7 o'clock. It's a Tuesday here in beautiful uptown Hoboken. And uh, we are the Hoboken Historical Museum. And um, this is our, oh, I went too soon. There we go. It's, it's the museum collection tour. It's every object tells a story. And, um, and here we are. I'm Rand Hoppy. I'm the collections manager. I come after you with a bat for, to pay your bills. No, that's the wrong collection manager, right? I'm the archivist guy, the guy who takes care of the old stuff. And this is Bob Foster, the director. I like those graphics. Nice job. Oh, I like well, that. thanks. I, you know, I try. I <laughs> try no, to improve good. it a little bit each time. <laughs> yeah. I think we were last uh, presenting two weeks ago. So that's right. Yep. We have some new objects that tell stories about Hoboken. Yeah. And uh, we didn't agree who's going to start off. We didn't. Okay. Uh, go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we can do that. Yep. <laughs> um, so I picked this object. Okay. I'm just going to put it a little, a little boy, closer. This is a small plate. It's probably six to eight inches in diameter. And you probably have seen things like this when you visited antique shops and restoration villages and things like that. Uh, and it turns out that this plate does relate very strongly to Hoboken. Yep. Uh, it's known as Staffordshire or Shire China. Uh, it's produced in England. And this one dates to the 1820s. And its Hoboken connection is that uh, the architecture or the building that is pictured may look a little generic, but it's actually uh, a good representation of what was known as the Stevens Villa. Right. And we're talking 1820s. This was the first uh, private residence for the Stevens family in Hoboken. It actually burnt down at a certain period, I uh -huh. think in the 1860s, 1870s. Right. I could be off on that a little bit. But then the Hoboken uh, Castle, as it was known, became the new residence. Okay, so, so the villa was on Castle Point. Yeah, same location pretty much, but after the fire, uh, it, it became, you know, it became, it was rebuilt totally different, uh, different style, uh, but it still had that prominent location with a good view of the river. Right. And it said, when doing some research, they said very few of these plates were, uh, you know, designed after an American residence that oh. for the most part were okay. still in that time period where England or European villas were considered grander and more right. important. So I'm not sure if the Stevens family, you know, kicked in some bucks to make sure <laughs> they were represented here. Yeah. But it, what's one of the things that's interesting about this one, we have several of these plates. And, but this one has actually been repaired right. in a very professional way. I'm holding it up and you're actually seeing like staples. Yeah. And it's actually a beautiful uh, repair. And so if we were presenting this now, I'm sure we would feature the front, but we probably would have a visual digital yeah. display at the back yeah. to show the amount of care on it. And it is marked on the back. Uh, it says Hoboken, New Jersey. And uh, interestingly, this came to us uh, as a donation, and it came with this little presentation board, and the plate very nicely sits on this, okay? And this would have been the style that you, I know, uh, Rand's looking <laughs> yeah. at me like whatever, but I, even though I'm wearing a face mask, which I don't wear that often, I think I got this firmly in my hand. All right, looks good. Um, <laughs> and I'd hate to do a Zoom uh, uh, presentation and have it recorded <laughs> and, uh, and have this uh, problem occur. But uh, even this little board, uh, you know, I think it came from a private museum and then was deaccessioned and then was probably bought by someone and then came our way. Right. So I'm actually going to just take a second yeah. to read the label here. It's pretty interesting. And uh, oh boy, got to put my glasses on. Sorry, because right. I'm looking through the face mask too. Now I wish I had not started this. Okay, what do we got? It says 
Um, there's actually a source for this information, and it says plate made by Joseph Stubbs around 1825, and he operated a pottery in Burslem, England from 1790 to 1829. Huh. So we're looking at an object from around 1820, and the drawing for the plate is by William Birch. It's engraved and published by the artist in a book, and uh, it is been reprinted in other plate models, but what we have is an original, so yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah. And again, we're talking about uh, Colonel John Stevens, right. okay, and his family, and the plate goes on to talk about that originally the Stevens property was owned by Colonel William Bayard Stevens, uh, and that uh, during the Revolutionary War, the Bayard family were royalists, and the Stevens family were revolutionaries. Right. And uh, basically, uh, Bayard gets kicked out under the spoils of war, and the Stevens family buys it. Yeah. And of course, this is all before the college has started. Yes. And uh, the Stevens family had their principal residence in New York City, and you could say they kind of vacationed here yep. or summered it was here a villa. and uh, came to the <laughs> villa yeah. and had, you know, so eventually they start to develop Hoboken, right. but when they were living in the villa, it's the early time, 1820s, yeah. and this plate does tell a story. It has been repaired, but in a funny way, I like the fact that it was repaired and uh, <laughs> someone took so much time to yeah. do this professional repair. Yeah. So that's my story. All right. Okay. That's pretty good. Sure. The, um, what have I got here? Hmm. Well, here's one. Um, I don't really have much to say about it, but it's something cool to look at, which is one of the uh, Hudson and Manhattan Railroad common stock certificates, which I just love that etching. I'm a big fan of the etching. Steel engraving, right? right? right. I mean, etching, steel engraving. Steel engraving. The yeah. quality is amazing on yeah, these amazing. stock certificates. It's uh, So the Hudson and Manhattan Railroad was the uh, precursor to what we call the path train. Now, it was a very Im important tunnel that was built, I guess, in, what, was it like 17, 19, earlier than that? Uh, Do you remember? When it opens? Yeah, or, when it opens. We're, uh, it's funny, I'm spacing a little, but Me we're too. 1905, I oh, believe. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. So It was started much, much earlier, but because of uh, uh, blowouts and other trouble. fatalities yeah. in building it, yeah. uh, but it doesn't get so completed just, till later. Let's take a look at that again. That's just yeah. like the coolest thing. We do sell, like, we sometimes we have this on a print or something yeah, that's sure. available. Yeah, people, but, uh, since it's so visual yeah. and really shows the span underground and above ground, people love this. Yeah, that's right. And there's, I think, two or three versions there are. of stock certificates that's right. up yeah. there. As the, I think I, the, I, I, I bypassed the green one and went for the purple okay, one. Okay, <laughs> sure. And so the Hudson Manhattan Railroad does become the path. Right. Uh, and uh, that's also when there's the transfer of property of the Hudson Manhattan Railroad office buildings, which really make way for the building of the World Trade Center. Exactly. You know what? That's, one of, that's also one of my favorite things about this, too, is just to show it again, is the, the, uh, the, the H&M buildings there that sure. are just really significant. Right, and because, again, that becomes uh, the World, the Trade, World Center. Trade Center. And, and radio, radio Row that was around it sure. as well. There are many people who believe that the reason the Port Authority uh, bought the Hudson Manhattan Railroad, which was a losing transportation system, uh -huh. is because they really wanted that land oh, to build the World Trade Center. Wow. So it's kind of interesting. Wow. And a lot of people are a little confused by what PATH stands for. And so PATH, the port, P A T H, is Port Authority Trans Hudson. Right. So that, right. that's kind of interesting yeah. too yeah. on there. Well. Uh, have you been on the path lately? I was just the other day. Okay. Yeah, I took I took a, pa a panoramic shot of an empty train. Okay. <laughs> sort of like the buses, right? Yeah. Okay. They, yeah. They're on time, but uh, yeah. no one's riding no. them yet. I was a little, it was a little, it was a little more crowded on the way back to Hoboken. Okay. But my trip into Manhattan was sure. was, was very empty. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so I'm going to pull out another object here, and I just want right. to make sure that's kind of the establishing shot right. and
There might be a term for this, but basically it's a trophy uh, that is associated with the Schutzen Verein Club, uh, which had a chapter here in Hoboken. And this goes to the days when uh, the primary immigrant group or established group would be uh, German. Right. Uh, German are the first immigrants who came here. Um, the American Civil War, and yeah. they came with their culture and education. Right. And their different clubs and their different social things. And so uh, marksmanship. I mean, shooting sounds a little ominous. Okay? <laughs> right. They're not shooting people. Right. It's more about marksmanship. Yeah. Uh, clay pigeons, targets, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. And I don't know, it's going to be hard to see it, yeah. but this medal in the center yep. visualizes a shooter. Yep. And then each one of these links has, I believe, a similar design of a shooter. Right. Okay, it's going to be hard to see that. Yeah. And on the back, there's a name and a year for, um, uh, you know, a, probably a, a particular meet right. when someone won. Right. And so on the back of the medallion part, there is a name. We uh, said it before. It translates something like Bernard Sigenberg. I don't know if any relatives are out there. <laughs> and uh, it says Schutzen Verein Hoboken. So that's the Hoboken connection. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to assume we probably could actually research the name of this person sure. in one of our directories. He might have been a that's prominent right. local business person. And just like businesses do, they might sponsor a softball league yeah. or a team. So he is the sponsor of this medal. And this was donated to us in our early years, I think in the 1980s, mm -hmm. before we were here. And it was donated to us by Dave Marsh, who's no longer with us. He, Dave Marsh and his family ran um, uh, People's Photos, right. which was on Washington Street, uh, kind of close to East L.A., I think it's, maybe Symposia Books it's is Symposia there Books, now. Yeah. So uh, Dave Marsh uh, had some German ancestry on one side of the family, and somehow this had passed to him. And as they say, you can't take it with you. Right. So it became part of our collection. And when we've done different exhibits, we have prominently displayed this. But it's really a handsome piece. Yeah. So that's something that uh, has been stored away. Bob Kausch is saying hello. Wow. <laughs> Bob <laughs> Kausch in Kinelon, Kin I think. Yeah. 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 His, that's his, great. His dad was, uh, lived in Hoboken. Uh, and knew him as his dad is deceased, but knew him pretty well. And he was an early supporter of the museum. Oh, cool. And very involved, I think, with the Hoboken Community Church okay. on Fifth and Garden. Sure. And uh, but I have not seen uh, Mr. Couch for a long time. Oh. But he's so. a tennis player, as I uh -huh. remember. All right. Anyway, <laughs> so that's that's the uh, YouTube chat room. So if you have any questions or you want to say hello. Right. We welcome any yeah. kind of contact. So it's a, it's a good great. diversion for us. That's, that's right. Kind of line up our objects. <laughs> that's right. So that, that's good. Um, so what do I have? Let's see. Um, well, here's something that I just thought was interesting. I don't have a story about it. We know who it came from, but it's a, uh, a really old <laughs> Hoboken Board of Ed instructor t-shirt that's falling apart. You forgot to clean it. I know. Usually we launder our things. It looks like it's about vintage 1950, um, but I, I really don't know. Yeah. But, uh, this, uh, we were roaming around in Joe Sivo's uh, basement up on Mountain Road, uh -huh. and, uh, and he offered this. And... Uh, I figure it could be the only one around. It could be the uh, only one around. As they say, condition is everything. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I, you know, if it was a little bit bigger, I might have tried it on. <laughs> That's right. You I knew I'd be ripping it off. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope Joe Sivo is doing well up on uh, Mountain Road yeah. in West Hoboken, Union City. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, man. All right. I guess this is one of my favorite objects. Yeah. Okay. And how... Can it's we see so it? Good. It's, um, let's see. Mm -hmm. What do you want to do? Mm -hmm. Do you want to hold I'll, one in? I'll take hold? it and you talk about it. Okay. All right. Um, look at that. And I'll, I'll swivel it around. Okay. How's that? We'll All do right. a 360. Yeah. Okay. And I'm also going to tilt it. All right. Okay. 
So this is wooden. It's probably about, you know, 25 inches long. Yeah. And it's a very accurate wood model of a very simple uh, barge, a uh, deck scow. Uh, you could might call it a lighter, but that's almost too oh. fancy. Oh, yeah. Okay? okay, lighter usually would have some sort of crane on it to sort uh, of help unload. I gotcha. But you have to realize this is a pretty accurate model. And if you look at old photos of the Hoboken waterfront, Jersey City waterfront, these things are lined up like, yeah. you know, like you could you could walk along the waterfront and jump from deck scout <laughs> to deck scout. Right. Yeah. They were just stored here, sometimes abandoned here if they were no longer uh, seaworthy, shall we say. Right. So why this really accurate model? Uh, this was donated, that actually looks great on the screen, the angle you're holding. Oh, it. good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, this was uh, loaned to us and then eventually donated to us by Union Dry Dock. That's uh, an old company that started in Weehawken, and it was here in Hoboken. Uh, and their, their company history goes back over 100 years, but they disbanded. They shut down. Uh, the property that they owned here in Hoboken is under you know, some sort of review for a new usage and right. different uh, legal maneuverings. Yep. But this actually, this model is connected to legal maneuvering also. <laughs> <That's right>. Apparently, <laughs> if you worked for a maritime company and you were a deckhand on a barge, you, you know, it was a dangerous job. A lot of times people would get caught in between the barge and the pier. Uh, in the winter, they might have slipped. So this, what I was told by George Dreyer, who's sort of the grand patriarch of Union Dry Dock. Excellent. Uh, he told me that it was used in court cases. If someone got hurt, mm -hmm. they would bring this into the courtroom and they would have to testify that, you know, the ankle was broken because my leg right here. they jumped yeah. from one section to another. And wow. uh, deck, deck scows were kind of a lowly, you know, vessel. Uh, not like, you know, as important as many other ships, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but this was work. This sure. is uh, on the open area of the deck scow. Uh, you might have stored, uh, there might have transported coffee. Coffee was one of the few things that would be transported that couldn't be, shall we say, put in uh, storage with no air circulation because it oh, could spoil. Got it. Sometimes a deck scow is still used today but probably transport, transporting garbage, okay? You still see deck scows going, barges mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on the river. But yeah. again, this would have been used in legal maneuvering, uh, uh, not legal maneuvering, but legal discussions right. on uh, sort of, uh, you know, to uh, uh, deal with medical costs and injuries and time off and yeah. things like that. Yeah. But it's really, really accurate. This is amazing. There are pieces that go across here and you could open up the deck. Uh, I would say, in terms of a wooden deck scow, in condition today, very rare. Um, the only one that I really know of that exists would be Barge 79, which is the Hudson Waterfront Museum, which is in Red Hook. It's in Red Hook. And uh, uh, they, they have a great program uh, letting people know about barges. Mm -hmm. Barges is a great topic altogether oh, because... <laughs> If you came to this country, uh, the, many of the barges were operated by the railroads because they okay. were involved with what they called the moving of lighterage, the moving of goods. Mm -hmm. And so many times an immigrant coming to this country might be looking for a job and there'd be people at the train station saying, do you want to be a barge captain? And that really meant a night watchman. Yeah. But actually this in the deck house here, uh, it, these would be the captain's quarters. Uh -huh. There's no engine on these things. They yeah. had to be pulled by a tug. And there are many people whose first job was as a barge captain. And we've met people who were raised. They'd be octogenarians now. But they were raised. Their family were raised them on like, a barge. Like That's that where was, they lived. That was their first American shelter. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. And it seemed wow. kind of glamorous living on a barge. Yeah. But in February... Then, you know, there'd be a potbelly stove inside there. 
But uh, when I see this, it evokes all these yeah. uh, associations with an immigrant coming here and their first job mm. and barge captains. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they, people essentially they were, you know, on a poverty level, just eking it out. But, but kids didn't know that. And they just thought this is the life I get to watch. Better, the sun. better than stacked up in a tenement in the yeah, Lower East Side. It could be. It could be. In yeah, a way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Less so, people around. So uh, that's, that's <laughs> our barge model story. Fantastic. I think I got it. That's okay. really good. Cool. Yeah. All right. What do I, oh, man, I have these two things. So, I, I, you know, this is just <laughs> this is stuff that cracks me up that I found. Um, we ended up uh, having the, finding these uh, two uh, items. Um, actually, they were donated to us. Um, but uh, they, are, they are programs from the Lions Club, 1994 and 1992. Maurice Fitzgibbons and Robert Menendez. And what, what I, I, I ended up uh, cataloging these guys and they, they, they're just very entertaining to me. I don't know, it's the thing that I like to do is, is you know, I scan it and then it's like, well, a lot of these names, I typed in all these names, um, you know, every page. Um, it's not on, the, not on our website yet, but just to, you know, mention, like, there's, you know, all these law offices and insurance companies and it's, it's, it's the movers and shakers. The movers and shakers. Nineteen ninety two. It just was. I don't know. There's just something about it. I really enjoyed um, doing the catalog. And of course, yeah. that's now Senator Robert Menendez. That's right. Uh, that's senior right. Senator that's from right. New Jersey. Yeah. But started right here in Hudson County. Yeah. Uh, as an aide to uh, Mayor Musto, Musto in Union City. Right. And there's a great story behind all that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of. And, and then Maurice and then Fitzgibbon, Maurice Fitzgibbon story, there's great stories about Maurice. <laughs> he's a big, both uh, Maurice is deceased, yeah. uh, but a big cheerleader for Hudson County yeah. and just involved in about every yeah. social Hudson County event yeah. from St. Anne's to Centennials and right. so on and so right. on. Right. And politics. And politics. So, yeah, yeah it was, I don't know, there, I, I just, uh, I don't even know if the Lions Club still meets, but... We're going to hear from them. We're going to hear, if you're from the Lions Club, give us a call. Right. They have a Zoom channel. <laughs> That's right. right. They're doing live streams now. That's yeah. right. They're, they're competing <laughs> with us right now. Um, so I just was going to bring out a photograph. Oh, yeah, great. Um, I don't know if people can see that. It's kind of a quirky, yeah. it's a news yeah. photo. It's a senior guy sitting on a chair. Yeah. Looks like he's... A little tired, not the best environment. Right. And um, I'm going to read. This is a news photo. And what's happened is that a lot of news services, which, you know, carried stock photos right. and had what we would call a photo morgue, mm -hmm. uh, are getting uh, sort of uh, uh, put back out into circulation. Right. And they're being sold item right. by item. Uh, the whole news business has, you know, hit a whole different yeah. area. Old still photographs are more interesting to collectors than probably a news service. Right. So uh, this has probably came to us through Justin Silverman, okay. who got a lot of items uh, into our collection yes. and probably was, uh, came by way of eBay, okay. I guess. Yep. And, but, you know, without the caption on the back, this means nothing to us. The guy in a chair, Bob. The guy in a what chair. Is it? Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to attempt to read again. Okay. And it says Joseph Braddock. I don't know if that name's going to ring a bell. Mm -hmm. 73 year old father of James Braddock, newly crowned heavyweight boxing champion, didn't let his sons sudden fame keep him from going to work after seeing James defeat Max Bayer on June 13th. Joseph Braddock, a night watchman on the Holland American Line, Pier 5 in Hoboken. That's a lot of detailed information. Fantastic. Again, Hoboken, New Jersey, is pictured on the job slightly after the fight, okay? <laughs> so, you know, it's the, it's the type of stuff you can't make up. You can't make it, up. it looks like uh, the senior Braddock here 
went through a fight himself. <laughs> yeah. And uh, people may remember James Braddock was a local guy. I believe he's from North Bergen. Right. And he actually worked in Hoboken also mm -hmm. in his... Uh, uh, well, there was a film a few years back called right. Cinderella Man. That's right. And I'm forgetting who it's starring. Uh, and but anyway, uh, and it was an okay film. But there, there is talk there in in the book, in the original book, Cinderella Man. It talks about James Braddock, the boxer, walking from North Bergen to the Hoboken waterfront to go into the shape up to kind of get a job for the day. That's not the. It's a quick. It's not it's a, a quick walk. walk yeah. Okay, yeah. and he'd be there for seven a.m. So he's leaving at, yeah. you know, five thirty. Yeah. But anyway, his dad. You'd think his dad could get him a job without having to walk <laughs> right. that far. Right. Uh, but his dad was the night watchman. Wow. So it's a. It's a great little photo. Yeah. And uh, uh, this might be a good segue. You talked about if someone wanted to order photos from our collection oh or could yeah. you show could you talk about I mean, how they I, might do that I, I have one more thing to say though sure mr braddock does have a park named after him that's right uh the braddock park um is the park in north bergen right it's uh oh gosh off of boulevard east yeah. but it goes all the way to kennedy boulevard it's, it's, it's a big park and there's actually a really dignified beautiful statue to James Braddock oh, that's wow. only about two years old huh. and it's on the east side of the park and uh, I'm not a big statue person <laughs> in okay. general and yeah. of course we do have our statue issues yes. uh, but this the way this statue is presented and I don't know too much about the personal life of, of Braddock right. but it's a really nice statue oh, that's cool. and uh, it's lit up at night and yeah. I think Cutson County can wow. be proud of this statue oh, so cool. if you're up there it's a these days that park is so well used because of the pandemic and yeah. you can really spread out yeah. in that park yeah. and great tennis courts up there oh, but right anyway hey. <laughs> uh, that's that's the James Braddock story and all again right. the film Cinderella Man is might be in people's is it Russell Crowe? It is Russell Crowe yeah I hate to say it I haven't seen the film but uh, neither have I okay okay <laughs> well, but if someone wanted like if a James Braddock relative was out there maybe you might want a copy of this picture well we don't so how would they do that it's not part of our website yet Okay, right. skip that. Doesn't matter. So don't but find anyhow. another photo that right. is part of our website. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna go and uh, what are we gonna do? I'm gonna go here. So this is our website, and we're we're down in the bottom there, by the way. So they can okay, see what we're sure, up to. I got it. Um, so you can go to our, if you go to our website and take a look at. Um, uh, cl the collections area and, and this to, getting there and using the website is all a free service that's right you go to online collections you go to keyword search which is the easy one or advanced search which is much more you know fancy and has all kinds of fields that you can fill out but let's say um, do you want to do yum yum because that's sure, maybe yeah, our next yum -yum. Uh, yep. so topic I would do I would just put yum in to be <laughs> honest Okay. And let's see what we get. Uh, and we, you, yeah, this is good. So here's here's a digital here's a digital image of Lucy Principe, um, and uh, so that's the image. But you can you can click on the image, and here's the a, a larger version. But then down here, over in over, <laughs> almost covered up by our by our our, our video there. Is, an, is something that says request image. And if you click on that, is that gonna show up? It's not, not showing up. up. All right, one moment. Uh, see now, that's an old, okay, here we go. Um, so here's, here's a form that you can fill out and you can put your name in and um, it talks about like how much how much it costs because I'm actually going to leave just for a second, but keep okay. talking about that. So there's it, you can you can put uh, your name and your address and your phone number, and uh, you can, uh, email address and it talks about the sizes that the uh, that, that we offer. We we offer anything from small to very large, and um, you basically put your put your request in there. Say that you're not a ro robot, and uh, submit the report, and I'll get an email. So, uh, and and then I will engage with you as to taking care of the payment and all that kind of stuff. 
So, so can you tell them, can you give them a rough idea of cost? Um, yeah, so the eight and a half by 11 or 11 by 17 is $25. Okay. And, and the, then there's, um, there's tax. Sure. And if you want, we, we can ship it to you and we'll right. have some shipping on but it. But most people are local yeah. and they just stop by. Yeah, and we'll, when it's it's but, printed on a nice great paper. Beautiful paper. And we, we, we always request payment before printing. That is true. That is true. So, and you can just call on the phone too. That's right. right. That's right. Yeah. So that's something that one, one of the fun services that we have. Okay. I hope that that worked out there. Let's go back to us. All right. So and let's, um, I'm going to bring up an object that is associated with Yum Yum. Oh We're yeah, trying great. to do these nice transitions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. let's do it. Uh, so um, here's our object and looks a little menacing. Uh, and uh, first I have to put Yum Yum in context. Yes. Okay. You know, there's a lot of ways to talk about a history of town, of a town and uh, a, a great connection with history is also food. And so many people will have a food memory that's associated with yum yum ice cream. And so okay. we, how do I describe yum yum ice cream? I don't know of anyone making it in Hoboken anymore. Okay. Uh, we have done many events where we have provided yum yum ice cream, but okay. I hate to say it, I usually have to go to Lynnhurst uh, to the okay. Lynnhurst pastry shop, which I love. And they give us five gallons and it goes <laughs> a long way. Oh, wow. And uh, even during the pandemic, people have stopped by and go, are you going to do anything with yum yum ice cream? And I kind of go, I hadn't really thought mm -hmm. about it. But anyway, <laughs> yum yum was something for kids growing up, a big deal. Uh, just like, you know, Carvel or Mr. Softy okay. or things like that. And... Uh, there was a manufacturer of Yum Yum in, in Hoboken. I believe there were more than one, but we do have items. We do have some nice pictures from Mike Conte, who's deceased, but gave us a great sampling of it. Great. We even have like recipe books nice. and yeah. uh, different um, records of the charges and things like that, and pictures of the carts they had. And of course, with making ice, uh, this is kind of a lemon ice or a vanilla ice, mm. uh, and apparently there was a raspberry ice. So yum yum is a style of ice cream, but there are only like three flavors. Okay. And of course, with ice cream, there's a lot of ice making. Uh, you need ice to uh, get your ingredients cold. Right. And of course, this goes, this takes place before there's the refrigeration that we're used to. Right. And so. This, I'm forgetting the actual name. Okay. I'm going to call it an ice pick, okay, sure. or chopper. Yeah. And basically, oh, there would have been ice saws. And so the right. ice man would deliver huge blocks of ice, yep. which were very heavy, and that you probably, to save costs, would harvest it to the size you want. Okay. Now the comparable thing would be like, going to the liquor store and getting ice cubes. Okay. But this is much larger chunks. So this is was given to us by Mike Conte. Uh, he was the stepson of Nikolai Principe. And so different last names. So the Principe family were the Yum Yum manufacturers, but Mike Conte, you know, had a separate name through his, you know, a different marriage. Right. And so um, so we, we have Mike's word that this is the yum yum ice pick, Fantastic. which, you know, pretty cool. <laughs> if you want to scare kids away at events, <laughs> you just right. come out with this. Yeah. And then we also have, um, ice tongs, which oh, wow. are a little more generic, yeah. but again, coming from, uh, Mike Conte and said that this is how they dealt with the ice. The ice Mike, man cometh, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, Mike Conte was a little guy. He's like five foot three. Uh -huh. He loved Frank Sinatra. Uh -huh. He loved Hoboken. I believe he moved to Hasbrook Heights area. Okay. And these were, when I pulled up to visit him once, these were actually like screw mounted into his garage door. Oh, wow. You know, it was sort of like, uh, I don't know, like a memory tool or object. Yeah. And he was very... Whenever he would say yum yum, he would just break into a big smile. <laughs> uh, probably a bigger smile for Frank Sinatra. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, someone I really 
remember dearly mm. and uh, knew him really because his association of Frank Sinatra. Oh. But then the Yum Yum connection happened, you know, it was, it was love. It was oh, love. So anyway, yeah. uh, so these are pretty standard objects, but with the pictures that we have on our website, yeah. with the stories that Mike told us, right. uh, we have a nice grouping of things. And we probably mentioned that, that the object is important, but so is the story. That's right. And so is the paper that supports it. Yeah. And so are the photographs. So yeah. it's kind of a package. It is. Yeah, that's that. really nice. So yeah. cool. Well, Bob says he's in Hamilton Square. Who? Bob Couch. Mm, oh, he is? Okay. And, uh, he may, didn't he live near Kinelon once? Uh, <laughs> That's where my mom lives, so uh -huh. I thought there was maybe... Oh, and, and Thaler is reporting that, that this is the highlight of Tom's week when we do this. That's so. very sad, Tom. <laughs> come on, man. Tom, really? You, you, you could come and be an audience, Tom. <laughs> yeah, we, right. we, need, we need some interaction. <laughs> All right. We do it for Tom <laughs> and Thaler. Uh, so I, I have this History of Hoboken, 1907, produced by the Hoboken Board of Trade, which is... Uh, I guess like the Chamber of definitely, Commerce, Definitely, right? definitely. Movers yeah. and shakers, business yeah. people. So it's, uh, it's just chock full of, it's got the history of Hoboken, but um, you know, we have, there's, there's the, the president of the Board of Trade. Right. <laughs> and we have... Uh, What's good yeah. about these things, they actually have really good statistical they information. Do. Yeah. And they usually have an index, <laughs> yeah, which we like. And and, and, and so it, things like population and yeah. things like that are all in there. It's it's you know, and it, it's it's for us, you know, we we we've seen you know the photos before. Like we're right. very familiar with the with the, I guess the Walter photos or, or whatever the, the yeah. But uh, something's nice. Like here's here's like a illustration version of the of the firehouse that used to be down where city hall is right right yeah. which we don't i don't there may be a picture of there's it in a the fireman museum yeah this is based but, on it yeah. uh but we don't you know there aren't any wood frame structures no. from that period no, uh, no. Are burnt down <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah, apparently uh, an, another firehouse i believe that was over by on along the river the oceana firehouse okay right which is uh I and thought... all the firehouses in the day would have had an observation tower right you know so you right. could really so. check out where the fire was yeah um but it's just you know it's just one of those things that again like bob said it's just chock full of in information it's a kind of an almanac or a record of the schools, you know, the, right. the, the churches. Over the years, these type of things would have less and less information and more and more advertising that yeah. they were really uh, for raising funds. Raising with nothing yeah. wrong with that, but right. the earlier ones can give you a lot of yeah. uh, information. They're meant to sort of uh, promote civic pride. And 1907 is the year of this. It happens yes. to be the year of a lot of prominent buildings being constructed, yes. including the train station. That's when it opened. Right. I mean, uh, and, and to, to your point in a way, there's some, some lovely uh, engravings in, in, in the ad. There are some ads, and they, they're in the sweet back. in their own way. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, many times they're for industries that, like a coal company, which I'm, isn't getting used as much. I'm loving the Duke's house. Duke's house, yeah. And very. So Duke's house was we down. We should actually pull out some uh, artifacts from Duke's house yeah. next time. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of nice things. Yeah. I forgot about Duke's house. Yeah, I love Duke's anyway. house. Anyway. Yeah. Burned cool. down, but right. Uh, right, right, right there by the Baker Waterfront Center. That's correct. Yeah. yeah, it was so. a fancy restaurant in yeah. the day. Oh, also, here's the Hoboken Land and Improvement Company ad. Right. With kind of a badly, a badly half-toned illustration, and it just took me a, a moment to realize it's Bloomfield Street and 13th. Right, a hop, skip, and a jump. Yeah, from yeah. here, and uh, so that was that was kind Hoboken of. Hoboken Land and Improvement Company was kind of the real estate and development division uh, that originally was the Stevens family. Yeah. And then, uh, for different reasons, they formed a corporation. 
and built a lot of Hoboken and sold all, and owned, owned all of Hoboken, That's really, right. yeah. and sold it off in lots yeah. uh, or built a suit. Yeah. And uh, speaking of that, all right. I have another photo. All right. And this, um, again, probably from a, a photo morgue that was yes. put out there. <laughs> and uh, hard to see the individuals, yeah. uh, but the sort of uh, um, the woman in the center, I'm not sure. I'll I, do it. I'll okay. Do it. Is, is she in the center? I She's can hardly center, tell. Yeah. The woman in the center, uh, there is a caption on the back, but it's not as maybe interesting as uh, the other one oh, for the Braddock. Braddock. Yeah. But uh, the woman in the center is known to us as Hetty Green. And Hetty Green sort of gets like written up in a fairly negative way. Right. Uh, she and But some of it probably is not true. Uh, right. from different biographers that right. we've had speak at the museum. Right. But she was considered to be the wealthiest woman in America. Right. We're talking, uh, let's see, her death date is probably listed here. Um, when she died, her estate was at $67 million. Whew. Okay. That's a lot. But she was also known as very being very miserly. The Hoboken connection is that she actually lived in what was known as the Yellow Flats, right. which is actually just yeah. uh, west of us yep. at 12th, between 12th and 13th on Washington and also borders on Hudson. And those apartment buildings uh, known as the Yellow Flats were, I believe, built by the Hoboken Land and Improvement uh -huh. Company. Sure. And they were considered kind of modest, uh, ups, not upscale, but just not, like tenement tenement they right. were modern they had better air ventilation which is a big time mm -hmm. a big thing at that time but hetty green here she is wealthiest woman in america and comes to live here in hoboken and why apparently the way the banks were set up uh, that if you had a large deposit in new york city and you lived in new york you had to pay a special tax. Oh, okay. So rather than live in New York and pay this tax, which she could well afford, sure. <laughs> she, um, she decided to live in Hoboken in a fairly modest apartment and take the ferry every day from 14th Street, which oh, was running. Perfect. Um, yeah. It gets a little more, it gets worse. Uh, she apparently, uh, she, I think she definitely had one son. She right. may have had more children, but her son was um, developed some issue with his leg and was really dependent on his mom mm -hmm. for uh, resources. Mm -hmm. And I think he's a young adult at this time. But anyway, Hetty Green refuses to take him to a doctor because she didn't really think the money was worth it. Oh. And in the end, the son had to have his leg amputated. Wow. Okay, that's the way it's written up. I can't verify it sure. all the way. Sure. And then there are stories of her uh, lending money to Hoboken storekeepers at 20%, oh you know, well above yeah. bank rates of the day, okay. and really leaning on them. Wow. And then also stories that she refused to pay uh, the dog license. She was always seen with this little Pekingese style okay. dog yeah. and she refused to pay the dog license and she received a fine, which she supposedly never paid for not taking on this license. Wow. So Hetty Green, richest woman in America living here in Hoboken. And this photo is really talking about her death, uh, okay. which, uh, you know, obviously sad, but yeah. she... She really did not, You, I mean, she was the ultimate, like Hoboken was a bedroom community for her. She did not get involved in Hoboken. Yeah. She did not get involved in the community. It was more like, uh, you know, I don't want to pay that tax. Yeah. So that's the Hetty Green story. And uh, we've written about Hetty Green many times in different publications mm -hmm. we've done. Right. And uh, we've, I think we've had at least three different authors speak about her. So just want to make sure you know about Hetty Green. And, and, and it was like her, her father or her parents' whale oil fortune? Originally, she's from Massachusetts. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm not sure, like a whaling community, yeah. like New Bedford, right. that kind of thing. Yeah. And so her initial fortune 
was from her family, but she was really no, good at absolutely. at increasing that fortune, yeah. and she does get credit for taking that original, you know, well, I'll say five million, and right. really, you know, increasing it many fold. That's right. She was quite, you know, sometimes people say she's a he or she is a good business person, and that can mean different things. <laughs> but she she apparently could definitely add the zeros to the bank yeah. account. Yeah. On yeah. there. So yeah. that's our friend Hetty right. Green. Hetty Green. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. What else is there, Bob? Oh, I have other things. Oh, what well, about that potholder over hey, there? Hey, what about that's that potholder? So, one of, so, you know. Hold it, it up. Hold it, it up. It, it's one of the best. Um, it, it, a rare, rare item. Uh, What's it say on it? it they says, may not be able to read it. Warmest holiday wishes from Councilman Peter Camerano. Okay. Okay, so, so um, I'm going to guess that this is a political item that was created by Maurice Fitzgibbons, right. who was very involved with Hudson County politics. He was a freeholder. Yep. I think he was a councilman himself, but I, he definitely ran, but mm. who knows. But anyway, he was, he was really uh, savvy of what people would appreciate. And he was groomed by other people, so he created this potholder. Uh, and he had it for all the different candidates. I actually, I didn't read this carefully before. I thought this was something this from was the Peter's mayor. mayor run. And of course, those objects, artifacts, are very rare because you know, probably I, business cards weren't even printed up for that. I, I grabbed it thinking it was the mayor one, you too. You did, too. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, okay. I think so we do have a mayor. We do have a oh. mayor one, and I know because <laughs> Maurice Fitzgibbons one day, you know, drove up and he says, "I got stuff in my car yeah, for you." We got. I and, got a box. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so we we, we uh, Bob at, Bob Couch asked like, "Where is our stuff?" And we, oh, we do have a separate don't tell, location. Don't tell. No, it's a separate ahead. location, and yep. it is it generously donated to us by. Right. By the Barrys and Iron State Applied Development. Sure. I mean, most of you know the museum is physically small, and so we do have another storage space or right. collection space. We don't like to say storage because no. it makes it sound like the basement. Right. We have a, uh, a room that's not quite as big as the museum. Right. It's out of the flood zone. Yep. And we have the keys, and we control it to a degree. That's right. Uh, and that's where we store things. Yeah. And there's no secret that, you know, we continue to collect, but we have run out of space in a sense, meaning for us to sort of have a section for, shall we say, photos and know where those photos are. That's right. Or uh, things associated with brewing in one place, right. which is what you want. You need a lot of space to spread out. We don't have that. No. So one of our issues is actually finding the stuff right? right when we do an exhibit yeah. and i go ran where's that sign uh from the washington street business yeah we don't exactly time. know not always okay right. i hate to admit that yeah. but one of our dreams is to have a larger space for collections but of course if it's not accessible to people it's hard to inspire them right so that's right uh, you know, we, we've obviously hit a blip with all the world going to hell right now. But <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, once we get back on track, we do want to think about a space for collections. It's got to be our own. It's right. got to be secure. Right. Can't be in a flood zone. If anyone has ideas or wants to donate a building or stock right. so yep. we can cash it in That's and, right. and do that, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. No pressure. No, no, no pressure. pressure. <laughs> the collection is safe. Yes. and secure, and we're so thankful we have that space, but we would like to make it a little more user-friendly, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, we'll see. Yep. We'll see. Yep. Yep. Gary Berman asked if there was an index in the 1907 book, but there isn't. You could... I thought there was. I'm sorry. I it's, let it's, Gary... It, uh, yeah, it's... it's, it's, it's um, I mean, there, there's some... There's like a... Who, who are you looking for? Oh, he's, he's, he says uh, Jackson, Von Minden, or Rollenhagen. Well, we can research that, but it may, may be a little more than we can yeah. handle right now. Yeah. Since you emailed those names, we'll look them up. Yeah. And so. we love the Bermans. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, all right. And, um, well, uh, 
I got, I got. What are we I, doing? We we're, got... we're close, yeah. but let me, I'm not sure if this is the ending item. I don't but, know either. <laughs> um, I guess I got a couple thoughts. Well, I don't think I showed this can before. We do have so many packaged cans. And I'm, I'm all confused now. You you have Lipton and coffee together. I'm that's used right. To Lipton tea. Right. That's what I wanted to get across <laughs> is that everyone is sort of uh, branded for Lipton tea. Yeah. But it turns out they made coffee. What the heck? Okay. And what's you know so there's that contradiction, uh, that reality. Yeah. I mean this is an actual can, <laughs> but there's also a beautiful. A visual graphic, oh, yeah. if I'm sort of presenting it yeah, well, yeah, of the factory. Yeah. So, you know, the Lipton Tea Factory also incorporated Standard Brand, right. which is now Hudson Tea. Right. Uh, but how often does a company feature their building, <laughs> not their corporate office on no, Fifth Avenue, no, that's right. but their, corp uh, their no. industrial building where they make the stuff? Okay, so thank you, Colonel Lipton. It's all. I thought that, that was cool. That's a very confusing thing you have. Yeah. Right no, there. I know, but <laughs> um, so it does say on the side, drink Lipton tea and coffee. Oh, nice. Okay. So you know how all it right. is. You don't want to put all your eggs in one oh, basket and just and do tea. I'm gonna look at this a little closer. Hold okay. On. Wow. Yeah. Mm, wow. And the reason I brought that up is that. You know, it's always interesting to see what type of things people bring by the museum and just say, hey, take, do you want this? And I think it was just yesterday, uh, Michelle Bufus, who just lives a block away over oh, on cool. Garden Street, yeah. is going to be relocating and was going through her things. And lo and behold, she has these kind of mineograph documents. Uh, they're like 15, 20 pages, okay. that old gray uh, purple carbon copy you know type ink on yeah. them and at the top it says um, well let me read the other one um, her both her parents worked at standard brand she said oh, wow. and her father was the shop steward so that meant okay. he got involved in union issues okay and what I'm holding here is a document that gives the demands for the new union contracts oh, on 12 4 1952 huh. and the pay raises are i mean it mentions everyone by name their profession oh, what they man. did that is cool. and uh there is actually a differentiation between male and female pay raises for different jobs okay just so happens i think today is the 19th the amendment uh, yeah. emancipation women's right to vote right. this is 1952 so the men are getting like three and a half no the men are getting six cents uh, six and a half cents an hour raise i think it's hourly yeah as opposed for the day and the silex girl another position yes. is getting three and a half cents oh, so wow. you know that job disparity is right here yeah. this is the union presenting their demands <laughs> right. to management right. and when i asked uh, michelle about it i don't know if she's with us but i'm glad i could incorporate this yeah. uh, michelle uh, parents were ralph and lucille and i asked them what what was your parents jobs you know because all yeah. these jobs had a speciality to right. them and she said, Dad was a T-ball packer. Nice. And Mom was a, oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mom was the T-ball packer. Okay. And Dad was the green coffee dumper. So I just All love, right. you know, <laughs> I love the, the packer and the dumper yeah, meeting yeah, in the yeah. hallway. Right. And, uh, you know, living happily ever <laughs> after right. and living on Uptown Garden Street. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Oh, that's um, great. And then the last thought I had, am I pushing too much? Can I do one more quick? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I don't have an object to back this one up, All just right. a story. Okay. It's probably just last week I get a, um, a text from someone, someone in Wisconsin, and he sends me uh, a death certificate, you know, the, a digital copy of the family death certificate for his great-great-grandfather. And he said that... You know, I don't know anything about Hoboken. I've never been there, but it looks like my great great grandfather yeah. <laughs> died at a particular address in Hoboken. And can you let me know if the building exists where he died? It was an accident. Yeah. And so death certificates have, you know, basic sure. information, dates. Turns out this gentleman was um, a shipyard worker, okay? Yep. And the address where he died in this lumber timber falling on him accident was 1301 Hudson Street. 
that we are standing right now in 1301 Hudson. Right here. So this guy reached out from <laughs> Wisconsin, and I could verify that I knew where 1301 Hudson was, and <laughs> it sent a chill. Yeah. It sent yeah, a chill. That's great. And of course, I had this image when I walk in the walkway. <laughs> you see all those big timbers <laughs> up there. I think of you know this one of these timbers falling on this guy. Yeah. So a little funky as yeah. an artifact. No. Uh, but it was. It was something uh, I wanted to share. Yeah, oh, that's a good one. Anyway, and so I, that's what I got. But what do you you want to end I, on anything? I, I, no, I'm, you're I'm, fine. I, I, I think I'm done. Tom um, wants more. Okay, no. <laughs> I know, but okay, there, <laughs> he's gonna have to wait. Yeah, no, I you know just uh, it's great to see everybody uh, chatting in the in the chat room. Thank you. Should we we I feel funny though. We should make a little plug for donation. I've been uh, I've been putting been doing them that. Up. Okay, been, you so. know I'm just gonna say. We're in a tough period. We love doing this virtual program. We like hanging out. Yep. But if anyone feels they'd like to contribute, you know, yep. based on some of this conversation or they've been meaning to donate, uh, not that it, you know, totally makes our day donate or not, but it is a nice thing. Yes. And uh, we need to, uh, you know, verify our purpose. Here, <laughs> so right. They say it helps. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so in the spirit of Hetty Green, yeah. <laughs> uh, donate more than 50 cents. That's right. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway. That's great. So, okay. Yeah, I think we'll leave it at that. We're heading out. All can right. we do a handshake? We can. Okay, good. I'll wash okay. my hands in a minute. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank, you, Rand. Night, Thank you, Rand. Everybody. Thank you, everyone, uh, for signing everybody. in. Uh, I got to click a button. Where's that button? <laughs> And that's it. Okay. That was great. Cool. Yeah. Cool.